Letter 70 From Seneca to Lucilius Narrated by Jason Youngman After a long interval, I have seen Pompeii, your hometown. It took me back within sight of my youth. I felt as if I could still do the same things I did as a young man. And in fact, as if it were only a short while since I did them. Lucilius, we have screwed at the shores of life. When one is at sea, as our poet Virgil says, lands and cities drop away. And it is just the same with us on this voyage of speeding time. First we lose sight of our childhood, then of our youth, then of the entire interval between youth and age, and then of the best years of old age as well. Finally, there comes into view that ending shared by the entire human race. We think it is a rock. That's insane. It is the harbor. And sometimes we need to stare for it, but never away from it. One who has been carried there early in life should not complain any more than a sailor whose voyage has gone quickly. For as you know, one traveler is held back by lazy winds that play games with him and weary him with the boredom of a completely flat calm, and others driven swiftly on by an ungovernable gale. Imagine the same thing happening to us. Life rushes some people toward where we are all headed, no matter how we try to delay. Others it leaves to steep and simmer. As you know, life is not always something to hang on to. Our good does not consist merely in living, but in living well. Hence the wise person lives as long as he ought to, and as long as he can. He considers where he'll be living, and how, and with whom, and what he will be doing. He is always thinking about the quality of his life, not the quantity. If he encounters many hardships that banish tranquility, he releases himself. Nor does he do so only in the extremity of need. Rather, as soon as he begins to have doubts about his fortunes, he makes a careful assessment to determine whether it is time to quit. It is a matter of indifference to him whether he brings things to an end himself or only accepts the end that comes, and whether it happens later or sooner. He does not fear that end as if it were some terrible loss. No one can lose much when what he has is only a driblet. Whether one dies sooner or later is not the issue. The issue is whether one dies well or badly. And dying well means that one escapes the risk of living badly. For that reason, I think it was quite unmanly for that fellow from Rhodes, when he said, the one who had been thrown into a cage by a tyrant and was being fed like some wild animal. When someone urged him to stop eating, he replied, while life endures, all hope remains. Even if that were true, life is not worth buying at every price. Some things may be important, may even be certain of attainment. And yet I would not attain them through a base admission of weakness. Am I to think that fortune can do everything to a person as long as he remains alive? Rather, fortune can do nothing to a person as long as he knows how to die. And yet there are times when even if death, certain death, awaits, and he knows that his sentence has been predetermined, he will still not lend a hand to his own execution. Only if it were in his interest would he do so. It is foolish to die merely through fear of death. Someone is coming to kill you. Wait for him. Why the rush? Why are you the stand-in for someone else's cruelty? Do you begrudge your executioner his task? Are you sparing him of the trouble? Socrates could have starved himself to death, hmm? choosing a lack of food over the poison. Yet he spent thirty days in prison waiting for death, not because he thought that anything might still happen, as if such a long time had room for many possible outcomes, but so that he might submit to the laws and give his friends the benefit of Socrates' last days. To despise death, but fear poison, could be more foolish than that. 
Scribonia, a serious woman, was the aunt of Drusus Libo, a young man who was as stupid as he was well born. He was very ambitious, more so than anyone could be in that period, and more than he should have been in any period. He was sick and had been carried from the Senate in a stage. Mind you, he was not well attended. All his relatives had shamelessly deserted him, for by that point he was the deceased rather than the defendant. He then began to take counsel whether he should commit suicide or whether he should wait. Scribonia said to him, Why does it please you to do another's business? She did not persuade him. He laid hands on himself, not without reason, for one is bound to die in three or four days at an enemy's behest, then remaining alive is doing another's business. Hmm? Therefore you may not be able to make any overall pronouncement about what to do when death is predetermined by external power, whether to go ahead with it or wait. For there are many considerations that could draw you in one direction or the other. If one is death with torture and the other easy and uncomplicated, why not put out your hand and take the ladder? If I were getting ready to sail, I'd pick out a ship. If I were getting ready to move in somewhere, I'd pick out a house. Just so, if I were about to die, I would choose my manner of death. Besides, in the same way as long duration does not of itself make life better, so long duration does not make death worse. In death, even more than in other things, we ought to make allowances for temperament. Let a person make his exit according to his own inclination, whether he prefers the sword or the noose or some poison that spreads through the bloodstream. Let him go forward with it and break the bonds of servitude. A person's life should be pleasing not only to himself but also to others. His death need only please himself. The best death is the one he prefers. It is foolish to think. One person will say, I did not act courageously enough. A second will say, I was too rash. A third will say another kind of death would have been braver. Remember, if you will, that reputation has no bearing on the decision you now have in mind. There is only one consideration. To escape fortune's grasp as quickly as you can. Otherwise, we will have people showing up to raise objections to your action. You will find some people, even some committed philosophers, who say that one should never take violent measures against one's own life, feeling that it is wrong to become one's own murderer. They say one should wait for the end that nature has decreed. Those who say this do not realize that they are blocking the road to freedom. Of all the things the eternal law has done for us, this is the best. We have one way into life, but many ways out. Am I to wait for the cruel action of disease, or of a person, when I could pass through the mist of my torments, shake off my adversities, and depart? This is the one reason why we cannot complain about life. Life does not hold anyone by force. The human condition is well situated in that no one is miserable except by his own fault. If it suits you, live. If not, you are allowed to return to where you came from. You have often endured bloodletting in order to relieve a headache. People sometimes sever a vein as a way of losing weight. There is no need of a huge wound that splits open the chest. A lancet opens the way to that great freedom. A nick buys your tranquility. What is it then that makes us idle and reluctant? There is not one of us who thinks of the time when he must leave his apartment. We are like aging tenants, who even when mistreated still allow themselves to be detained by habit and by their fondness for the place. Do you want to be free as concerns your body? Dwell in it as one who will move on. Keep in mind that you must someday be deprived of this habituation. You will then face your eviction more courageously. 
But how can people take thought of their own end if they desire all things without end? We need rehearsal for this more than anything else. With other things, we will perhaps turn out to have practiced them in vain. We have prepared our minds against poverty, and our wealth has remained. We have steeled ourselves to disregard pain, and have been lucky enough to have sound and healthy bodies that never demanded any proof of our courage. We have taught ourselves to be brave in facing the loss of those we love, and fortune has kept our loved ones alive. Yet for this, and this alone, the day that will put our preparations into effect cannot fail to come. You need not suppose that only great men have been strong enough to break the bonds of our human slavery. You need not think that it can only be done by Cato, who extracted with his hand the breath that his dagger had not released. People of the lowest rank have managed by extreme effort to escape to safety. When they were not accorded any convenient way of dying, and could not choose the means of death to suit them, they seized whatever was at hand, and by forceful endeavor made things into weapons that were not dangerous by nature or design. Recently, at the wild animal games, one of the Germans went off to the latrine during the preparation for the morning show. It was the only private moment he had without a guard, and there took the stick with a sponge attached that is put there for cleaning the unmentionables, and stuffed the entire thing down his throat, closing off his airway. Ooh, that was indeed offering insult to death. He went right ahead, unsanitary and indecent as it was. How stupid to be fussy about one's way of dying. What a brave man. He was worthy to be granted a choice in his fate. How boldly he would have used a sword. How courageously he would have thrown himself over some jagged cliff, or into the depths of the sea. With no resources from anywhere, he still found a way to provide his own death, his own weapon. From this you may know that there is but one thing that can delay our dying, the willingness. Each of us may decide for himself as to the merits of this ferocious man's deed, so long as we all agree that death, even the most disgusting, is preferable to slavery, even the cleanest slavery. Since I've started using unsavory examples, I'll keep on with it. Each person will demand more of himself if he sees that even the most contemptible people could hold this thing in contempt. We think that the Catos and the Scipios and the others whose deeds we habitually admire have been elevated beyond imitation. Yet I will now demonstrate that such courage is exemplified just as often in the wild animal games as in leaders of the Civil War. Not long ago, a man consigned to the morning spectacle was being conveyed there in a wagon surrounded by guards. Feigning sleepiness, he let his head sink lower and lower until he could get in between the spokes of the wheel, and then held himself down against his seat long enough for the wheel to come around and break his neck. Thus he used the very wagon that was carrying him to punishment as his means of escape. If what one wants is to break free and get away, there is nothing to prevent that. Nature keeps us in a prison without walls. If circumstances permit, we may look about for a gentle way out. If there are many instruments at hand with which to assert our claim to ourselves, we may ponder the matter and choose the best means of liberation. But if a person is in a difficult situation, let him seize on whatever is near us and think that best, even if it is strange and unheard of. Ingenuity will not fail him if only determination does not. Don't you see how even very watchful guards can be deceived by the meanness of chattel slaves? One's pain goads them into action. The great man is not the one who merely commands his own death, but the one who actually finds a death for himself. But I promised you some more examples from the same offering. 
During the second stage naval battle, one of the barbarians took the lance he had been given to use against his opponent and sank the whole of it into his own throat. Why did I not escape long ago, he cried, from every torment, every ridicule. Why, why am I waiting for death when I have a weapon? It made the show more worth watching, since from it people learn that dying is more honorable than killing. Well then, if desperate characters and criminals have such spirit, won't people also have it who have been prepared against misfortune by long practice and by reason, the ruler of all things? Reason teaches us that there are many ways of getting to our fate, but that the end is the same, and that since it is coming, it does not matter when it begins. That same reasoning advises you to die in the way you prefer if you have that opportunity. But if not, to do so in whatever way you can, grasping any available means of doing violence to yourself. It is wrong to steal the means of living, but very fine to steal the means of dying. 